Bill Campbell earned his Ph.D. in exercise, nutrition, and preventative health from Baylor University in 2007 and currently is a professor and doctor of the Performance and Physical Enhancement Laboratory at the University of South Florida. Bill has published over 200 papers, three textbooks, and 20 book chapters related to physique enhancement, sports nutrition, resistance training, and dietary supplementation, and his articles have been cited over 7,000 times. He publishes a monthly research review, Body by Science, that summarizes the latest and best research focusing on fat loss and building muscle. In 2019, Bill Campbell received the Nutritional Research Achievement Award from the National Strength and Conditioning Association, which recognizes a nutritionist for breakthroughs and contributions in the field of nutritional research for athletes. When he's not in the lab or teaching his students about exercise and nutrition, he enjoys lifting weights, spending time with his family, and eating buffalo wings. Welcome to the show, Bill Campbell. Yes, thank you for having me. Yeah, well, now that um, the question that everyone has starting off, what are your favorite buffalo wings? I, I like Hooters buffalo wings. Mm -hmm. I like. There's also a pl like a local place by my house that I really like too. It's um, it's just it's called New York New York Pizza, but I'm sure every city and every town has a New York New York type of pizza <laughs> place. So those are my two favorite kinds. Do you ever make them at home or is it like I'm going out and I'm getting buffalo wings? Uh, my wife has made, I, I have never made them. My wife has a few times, but typically it's more going out to get them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like wings, they are good in the air fryer and stuff, but there's certain foods where I'm like, I just want someone else to make them for me instead of me making them myself. Yes. Are, do you like buffalo wings? I do love wings. There's a place, well, it's a chain, but Roosters used to be like my all-time favorite wings. Um, and they had really good, I love wings with blue cheese, actually. I know ranch is very popular, but I was a blue cheese girl. Um, and so I really loved their wings. But um, sometimes within the fried food, it does tear up my stomach a little bit. So it's sometimes hit or miss, but I, I still enjoy a good wing every once in a while for sure. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have that problem. I, I know that some people do. Yeah. It, it's, it's yeah, like I said, hit or miss, but really my main passion lies in French fries and I don't have an issue with French fries. So I will just down those all the time. French fries and tortilla chips are like my two favorite things. <laughs> ah, yes. Very delicious. But almost all of the podcast episodes I could find you were a guest on were about fast or rapid weight loss. And it seems to be at the root of our conversation in a roundabout way as well. You had, or we had talked about a little bit that people don't always want to do something for their health. They would rather just look better. And I heard you say on a podcast that you sneak health in the back door. So I wanted to dig into it of the vanities in our health and our profession, uh, because the concept of healthy vanity is taking a healthy interest in what you look like, including your fat distribution, skin health, hair quality, posture, and overall everything you see in the mirror. So do you feel like there is a healthy level of vanity? Yeah, I think so. I think when you phrase it like that, a healthy level of vanity to care enough about how you're presenting yourself to the world, I think there is a certain level of that 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 is good. And like anything else, when things get out of balance, there's um, a level where that becomes unhealthy and obsessive. I agree big time. And I think it comes to kind of like where that pendulum swings. Is that too much of a good thing can always be a bad thing. And I think that when we're talking about how we look, sometimes it definitely can go into being way too vain or way too centered on how you look, that then it ends up diminishing your health in, in turn, whether it's your mental health or your physical health, um, or even like your emotional health. Uh, so I think that being able to talk about healthy vanity or like the vanity of health is very helpful overall because there's also that juxtaposition of people saying like, oh, you shouldn't try to change how you look. You should just be happy the way that you are. And I think that there is like balance in being able to improve how you look and want to look a certain way. Um, and there's space for that within your health as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, and I think just as you're, I'm just processing it as you're, you're talking the, the, the message about, oh, you should just be happy about the way you are. I, I love contentment and not always trying to, be, to beat other people. But at the same time, if you're, I don't, I just, there's something about that. You should just be happy 
I don't, that doesn't sit well with me. Just again, this is not me as a researcher. It's not me as a father, <laughs> husband, just as a person. I don't know if, if um, it, it, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm on the same page there, but kind of diving into you as a researcher, what started your interest in the field of research that you spend a majority of your time on? The initial passion was bodybuilding, competitive bodybuilding when I was a young man. And man, I'm getting old enough where I can actually say that when I was a young man, I still think I'm a young man, but I'm <laughs> actually not. So yes, I loved So I only ever competed in one show. But I just, I loved the bodybuilding lifestyle. And particularly, um, I like the sports nutrition aspect of bodybuilding, like taking, like I, the idea that I could take supplements to help um, accelerate my progress in that individual sport. And obviously, I got in pretty deeply into the supplement um, research and, and have realized there's not really that many supplements that are <laughs> that are actually that helpful. But that was my initial passion, like the idea that a supplement can help me get stronger or build bigger muscles, potentially lose more fat. So it was the bodybuilding lifestyle that got, that 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 formed the basis of what my lab exists for. Now, I, one thing I would say is. While I have done research on bodybuilders, uh, particularly uh, multiple studies in female uh, bikini competitors, physique competitors, essentially what I describe my lab is kind of dialing back from what competitive bodybuilders do and embracing and studying the things that help people optimize their physiques within a maintainable lifestyle. So what bodybuilders do, as you're aware, when they are getting on, when they're preparing to get on stage, that's not a sustainable lifestyle. So what are the things that they are doing that can be researched? And again, I, I would say dialed back a little bit so that people can have that lifestyle. Yeah. I think it was something you even had on your website of saying that a fitness lifestyle should be enjoyable. And you said, I want you to enjoy your fitness lifestyle. I believe that the way you enjoy your fitness lifestyle is to have confidence that what you're doing in your exercise and nutrition programs is correct. I never want anyone to feel like they're wasting their time or energy on diets that don't work for them or follow workout programs that are not based on evidence. And that's why I've dedicated my life to studying the most effective diets and training programs to optimize body composition. I embrace simplicity without compromising on what works. And I loved that snippet from your website because I think I, it reigns so true for myself and even within physique development of what we really try to drive home is the aspect of having something sustainable and creating a lifestyle instead of just reaching a physique. Because within bodybuilding, I've also gone through different shows and it's something that started my interest in health. And that's why I wanted to be able to kind of open with that is when I got into fitness, it was really all about how I looked. It was not anything to do with how I felt or what my health was. It was the fact that I had a lot of dis taste with how I looked. I didn't like how I looked and it was making me sad. And so I got into fitness and working out. And then that's when I started to get all of the health benefits of just feeling better and recognizing all of these things compounding time and time again. And within competing, I was fit like facing this juxtaposition of, okay, this isn't healthy to go to this extreme. You can still compete in a more healthy manner. It's not always healthy, but you can still have health in the forefront, but then also kind of pushing to that side of like those sustainable habits um, and being able to build that up. And that's also why I fell in love with learning about what I was doing because for so long I felt so trapped and like I was just spinning my wheels because I didn't know what worked or what I should do. I was just kind of following random advice I saw online. Yeah. And that's I th one of my statements on my website. Yeah. That's, it's, that's, that's, that's not fun when you just, when you feel like you're throwing darts mm -hmm. at a dartboard to think, oh, maybe this is it. Like it I think both of us kind of come from the same place. Like the bodybuilding lifestyle kind of has shaped our careers and our interests. And, and I'm, I agree. Like once you can get into the sweet spot of, Hey, I know that this works. I know why it, we're not that other things don't work, but this works best for me. 
and I can understand why, that that's so much more f- enjoyable. Mm-hmm. So within the comment of this works best for me, and then also doesn't mean that it's not going to work or that it's not good, how do you balance that within research? Because you're looking into and testing things to prove that they work, but obviously not everything works for each person. Yeah, I think the way that I look at research is research kind of provides the principles of let's say fitness or nutrition, nutritional concepts. So as an example, um, research has informed us that higher protein is better than lower protein if you're trying to um, to maximize muscle mass. And I would even say also helps with, with um, reducing body fat in certain situations. Now, the question is how much and how much can one tolerate? Well, that's where research just gives us a broad picture. Hey, more research or more protein within reason is better than low protein. So what, let me say that. And and uh, low protein intakes are not ideal for adapting to your training. And when I say adapting to your training, that's building muscle and also optimizing your physique. So even reducing body fat. Now, where... So research has provided that principle and research also has identified for most people a specific protein intake amount. But now it's the art of coaching and what you guys do so well is you have the science, but not every client, not every human is going to be able to match what the research says. And I, I, I look at the job of a good coach is to say, okay, how can we get you on the path towards what's optimal in research that you will sustain, that you'll adhere to throughout your lifestyle and enjoy this and know that that's being a a positive for you. Because if, like as an example, if I told my mom, hey, you have to eat a gram per pound of protein. Well, she's never going to do that. And she's going to feel bad about failing every day. So I think a good coach would say, okay, can I get you to eat more protein than you otherwise would without my guidance? To me, that's a win. And that that's what bridges the gap between research and principles and the art of coaching. I really love that you said that because Alex and I have a lot of conversations about the fact that people oftentimes take research and they take it as gospel. And they're like, this is what the research says. So this means that it's 100% going to work for me. And we really always try to say, and especially if we and we can kind of dig into this, if we look at the environment, which in research is done, which it's supposed to be an environment that lots of variables are controlled so you can see what outcome is happening. But then you also have to take into account First, the fact that other people in life don't always have those variables controlled. And then you also have to take into account of what it looks like for what the strengths and weaknesses of the study are. And that's a great thing that you do within Body by Science is that you really go through and make sure that you have the study's strengths and weaknesses highlighted so that people can see, yes, this is what the research says, but we also need to take this into consideration because I think that when we really talk about what it looks like when we talk about application and in the real world, and like you said, a per person of this might not, this might be optimal, but as far as what's going to work for this person, we need to keep that in mind as well. Yeah, I love, and with your permission, I would love to steal this from you for the rest of my life. Well, I love how you articulated research controls all other variables except for the the research question, what's under what's under investigation. And that is not how humans are. They, they don't have the other variables controlled in their life. So there's a big, there's a disconnect. Um, so can I use that? Yes, you can. <laughs> that is so true. I'll say Sue's uh, research is cited in one article. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right, I'll, maybe I'll reach that 7,000, but. <laughs> no, I love that. That is, that is very true. And here's something else that I guess a lot of people don't want to admit. What happens when the research is wrong? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you're old enough to remember, but research used to tell us that we needed to eat every two to three hours mm-hmm. to maximize our metabolic rates and to build muscle. Nobody thinks that now. We don't have to eat every two hours or every three hours. Now, some people can, and it's fine, but I'm old enough to remember if you were a fitness professional and you weren't having your clients eat on the clock about every three hours you were not evidence-based. And now we learn, you know, that probably emanated from a um, 
a, a correlation, not causation, or what we call reverse causation approach or analysis of that research. So as a scientist, we can also say, what the research can be wrong. What we think is true today may not be true in three or four years when we get more data. Mm -hmm. I think I love that about how open-minded you are when it comes to research, because obviously, like you talked about, there's a few different things, whether it's bias or that reverse correlation, causation. There's so many things that go into research. Um, is it like a blind study? Who is coming to the conclusions? There's a lot of things going into the research in and of itself, but I feel like you as far as I know, are extremely open-minded to research changing and being able to admit this is something new that I'm learning. And I think that's an incredible trait, not just within being a coach or being an educator, but just within life of being able to admit, I have now found new information and I'm changing my mind on this topic. Instead of a lot of people try to dig their heels in of this is what I once said, this is what I've been preaching, so I can't change my opinion or I can't change my thought process. Where where I saw it most recently is when we did the article for March for Body by Science, and it was about spot reduction. And you had very plainly stated of like, this used to be something that was just you, this isn't real. You can't spot reduce fat, but you were very willing to have a different opinion about that. Instead of say, this is what it's always said. You were able to say, this is what they're saying now. Let's look into it. Yes. And spot reduction, I'm I don't know if I've changed my – just on that topic. Yeah. I'm more open. The last two studies, and you being an expert on the one, you've read the research and, and commented on it. Uh, the last two studies on that have have reported a spot reduction effect. And just so everybody knows, um, I always use the example. If you do a bunch of crunches and sit-ups, do you lose fat around your midsection? Essentially is, what's, you know, the, the, is what spot reduction is advocating. Um. Early back in the 60s and 70s, the very first few studies showed a spot reduction effect. Equipment wasn't good using skin folds, and I like skin folds for a lot of things, but it's not the best technology for the precision that we would need for spot reduction research. Then we had about a decade of research saying, nope, this isn't a thing. And now the latest two studies, 2017, 2023, are saying, hey, maybe we need to revisit this. Here's our findings. So yeah, I think that's true with um, with a lot of things. But the, I, I'll never forget the whole meal frequency thing. I did a 180 um, within my professional career, teaching students one way and then realizing this is not good data that I'm relying on to, to say this. Yeah. And what do you say in those situations when you have preached something or taught something a certain way? What do you say in that instance of like, hey, my opinion has changed on this because a lot of people feel like they are damaging their ego or having to like hurt their pride of like, I was wrong about this thing. So how did you go about that? Yeah. So one, I appreciate it's easy for me to change my mind because I'm not, I'm not tied to anything. I get paid to, to read research, to teach students. So what I did in that situation was I just said, hey, here's what I used to think. Here's why I used to think this. And here's why I changed my mind. I was looking at, as we all were, but the data was this. And I looked at it like this. And then I realized, oh, there's something called reverse causation. And that kind of cha that changed the whole perspective. And then when we actually started getting research, when they gave people three meals versus 14, six meals versus three, eight versus three. And, you know, the actual intervention studies, not based on observational studies. And those studies started saying it doesn't make a difference on metabolic rate. It doesn't make a difference on your body fat or your, on your, your body composition outcome. So the best research was reporting something that the earlier observation studies was not. So that's, that's how I teach it now. And again, it's easy for me. I get the same paycheck whether I'm right <laughs> or wrong. I don't want to be wrong. Yeah. Um, and it, sometimes it's it it pains me how slow I need to be when I know people want an answer. Mm -hmm. But I'm not in the right profession. I need you know if I were a I don't know, an influencer or something, <laughs> I could have an opinion every day that could change. I I don't I'm 
I don't feel like I have, I have to have a lot of evidence before I'm going to speak publicly and have a strong opinion on something. Mm -hmm. And with you saying the best research, what would that be for anyone listening who's like, I, I haven't ever read a research article and I just might find something online and someone might say that they're evidence-based, even if I don't know if they truly are, what is classified as the best research? So let me get specific to the meal frequency studies. The best research in that case, well, the research question is, is eating more meals, more frequent feedings better than eating only a few times per day? And the argument is if you eat, let's say, let's say 10 times versus three, do I increase my metabolism? If I'm just eating more and more times throughout the day, do I have a faster metabolism? Because my body has to process all this food. And the best research studies in this case were, were when they had people live in a research facility for a couple of days and they gave the same subjects for a few days, 10 meals on, with, let's say, 2,000 calories. And then the same subjects, 2,000 calories again, but in three meals. And they measured their 24-hour uh, metabolic rate. And what we have is a few human studies. It doesn't, as long as calories are the same, whether you eat 100 meals or three meals, if the calories are the same, your metabolism is the same. So there isn't a specific example. In general, the best types of research studies are what we call intervention studies, where you, where you have subjects that enter a study pretty much the same. One group gets one treatment. The other group gets another treatment for several weeks, days, months, ideally years, but that's not really generally the case in, in body composition research. And the only thing that's different is that one treatment. And you, again, like we said earlier, you try to control all the other variables. So if you're giving one group let's say high carbs and the other group low carbs. Well, we want to make sure that all the other variables are controlled. So are they eating the same calories? Are they doing the same amount of cardio? Are they doing the same amount of steps, same resistance training program, ideally approximately the same amount of sleep? So the best research studies are called intervention studies or randomized um randomized clinical trials would be another way to say that. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people might not always understand everything that goes into research and being able to kind of pick apart what does make the best research because they might read an article and maybe it confirms something that they've already believed or that they want to be true. And they're like, I read research on it and it's true. So I'm all good to go. Um, and again, circling back to that body by science, you being able to show those strengths and weaknesses, I think very plainly and clearly lays out of, hey, here are variables they didn't take into consideration or here are ones that weren't controlled uh, because you also have to take into account that normally when it comes to doing studies, people are getting very low pay or not getting paid. And then it is going to be very difficult to have, like you talked about within the meal frequency of having people at the actual facility and controlling all of their food. A lot of times it can be something of people self-reporting or kind of you have a few variables controlled, but they're still going about different things because you can't always, if you're not paying someone a certain amount, get someone to be like, can you do this study for me and be a test subject for this? And you're going to get I'm just throwing out, I'm not saying this is what people get, but you're going to get $10 for doing this, but I need you to change every variable in your life to perfectly fix this. And it's like the pool of people who will do that and also might fit the markers of that study is very slim. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully more than $10. Yes. But, <laughs> but, you know, yep. just throw, throwing a number out there. <laughs> that would be a low number overall. Uh, so when it comes to you guys doing studies um, over in Florida, what does it look like for um, the, whether it's the current studies you're doing or just in general, what are some of the variables or controls you're trying to put in place for the people? So historically, one thing that I've prided myself on was we did a, like a lot of training studies. So whether it was, and most, a lot of our studies are in females. So whether it was a high versus low protein or giving some subjects a diet break versus a continuous dieting for week after week. What I prided myself on was we would have all of the subjects do their workouts in my lab. So we knew for sure they weren't skipping workouts and that they were pushing themselves during the workouts. And, and we could have win every set, every rep 
was observed. Uh, so that was one thing. We also would have them track um, all of their food intake to the gram. So just like your typical like macro counting, calorie counting. Now that's some level of trust. People can make up things, but you kind of, you get an idea. Like you, if you put somebody on a 30% caloric deficit and they don't lose body fat, then they probably weren't, uh, at least in the population that I'm yes. studying, which is typically young females, they probably aren't following. It's not like these people were, had metabolic disease or, or in perimenopause where there could be other issues. Um, so that's what we have done. And I would say we've done that at a high level. Now, currently we are starting to do, uh, we haven't launched this yet, but soon a virtual study where we are allowing our subjects to not live in Tampa, work out in my lab, but to do their workouts on their own while we institute a a um, nutritional intervention. So it's not as controlled, but the trade-off is we can get a lot more people to do the study. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible. You should you. lift heavy. High reps. Carbs low are needed. Keto squats are bad for your Squats are great. You for should squat astrograph. It's fine. It Macro fits my macros. It's for idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one-on-one -on -one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. Are there any studies that are ongoing right now for you guys? Um, You know, not act. I mean, we're about to launch two studies uh, we just submitted two other ones for publication, but th at this moment, in like as of today, we're not collecting data on any study, which is weird. That's not usually <laughs> the case. Now you just caught us in a very yes. just not done with a uh, couple things, and again, um, I, later this week, literally, we will start recruiting for the next study. What is the next study that you guys have coming up? So that that is our what I'm calling a virtual study. It's the um, it's a reverse diet study. So I'll, I'll just give a little background to this. So in the bodybuilding space, bodybuilding coaches diet their clients to step on stage. And then typically a good coach will have a plan for them after they compete. Because with no plan, what is often the case is competitors will, they'll gain a lot of body fat and body weight in the you know very short period of time. So bodybuilding coaches will institute something called a reverse diet. Um, some people call it a recovery diet, and there might even be other terms. that You guys might even have a different term. Back in the it. day, it was called a rebound diet. <laughs> okay, <laughs> or a rebound diet. So what we've done, typical to what my, um, my lab's um, fashion is, we're not testing this in bodybuilders. We actually, I actually tried a few years ago um, with one of my former students, James Longstrom, and I can talk about that, but it didn't go well. So now what we're doing is we're saying, okay, not, not competitive bodybuilders, but you're going to enter this study, and this is open to males and females, where we're going to help you. We're going to give you a plan. You're going to diet. You're going to lose 5% of your body weight. So we need you to lose body weight. Uh, and 5% is a clinically significant amount of current body weight to lose. And the subjects have to be resistance training, active, and all that stuff. And then after this, we're, gonna, we're, we're asking the question, what do you do when the diet is over? The goal is to maintain the weight that you lost. And we're going to do that with three things. One group, we're going to say, do whatever you want. Like, what if, we, what if we give you all these plans and it's really no better than what you would do on your own? So that group we're calling the ad libitum group. Another group we're having what we're calling the a reverse diet group where we're going to slowly increase their calories after their diet. And we're going to keep increasing week after week after week, hopefully getting to the point where they're maintaining their weight while still eating calories that they feel comfortable eating when they're not hungry. And then the third group, we're going to estimate their maintenance calories at their new weight loss and just automatically jump to those calories. Um, again, theorizing that they'll maintain their weight there. So this is a study, it's going to be, we're recruiting over 300 people for this. 
Um, again, we have the capacity to do that because one, I have a large research team. And two, we're telling them, you just, you don't change your current workout routine. Whatever you're doing, you continue to do, but you, the only thing you are changing is your diet to lose the weight and then the diet when the diet is over with our three interventions. I will be very interested to see the results on that because it's something that we've played around with and kind of, you know, done our own per se research <laughs> within clients and with ourselves of what that is best because there's a lot of conflicting information of how slowly you reverse or can you bring food up quicker. And what we found just personally is that we can bring food up quicker, but the training intensity has to be able to be at a certain level. And so we kind of have to gauge per person of if someone's like ending a diet diet and they're like really burnout. It was a hard push. Maybe they just had stuff going on in their life that it's much better if we kind of take a little bit of a break. Um, we be able to ramp training back up slowly and be able to move that food up slower. But then when it comes to people that are kind of like, I'm ready to hit the ground running and go on this reverse. And also we have to take into consideration each person's mindset because the person that is fine seeing the scale go up, if they're like, if all other metrics are fine, like they aren't someone who's so zoned in on the scale number that it messes with them too much mentally because like that scale number can go up and your body still look great or even look better than it looked. And so if we have to take that mentality into consideration, but if they're in a good place of being able to train hard, then we can jump that food up pretty quick and then be able to have that training in place. Um, and I mean, that kind of follows the general rule of like calories in versus calories out of being able to see that training intensity playing into how much output they're going to have for being able to have that input in place. So I'll be very interested to see the results of that. Yeah. Yeah. And you just highlighted a lot of the shortcomings of, of research. Guess what? We're not accounting for at all. Their mindsets. Mm -hmm. We don't have the capacity to, to work with every subject. And then again, you, you can't really control for that. So yeah, you're, again, this is a perfect example. We're going to say, Hey, for the average person, either increasing calories more quickly or increasing calories gradually or doing nothing at all other than just monitoring your body weight. That's a, that might be, we can say one of these seem to do better than the other, but that is again, where the art of coaching that co that research really cannot mimic, um, other than in a case study environment. Mm -hmm. With talking about research a little bit more, when it comes to those um, strengths and weaknesses within a study, when you do highlight those, what is something like, how do you feel like listeners or readers of Body by Science can apply that information in their life? If they've read through the study, they've read through kind of the outcome and then maybe your conclusion as well from that, but then they come to the strengths and weaknesses. How they, can they use that if they're wanting to apply that to their clients or to their own personal life? One thing I would always say, and it's not, it doesn't, it's not necessarily a strength or weakness, but it's something that everybody should look for is who was the population mm -hmm. used in the study? So one, if it's a rodent study, be very careful about <laughs> saying, oh, uh, look, at the, these rats gained all this muscle. I'm going to do that. Well, that might be helpful, but it also might not be helpful at all. So the closer the population is to you the more confidence you can have that you would likely respond to whatever that intervention was, whether it was an exercise program, a supplement, or a nutritional intervention, the more closely the population studied, the more, the more likely is that you would respond similarly. But we all know even in within a weight loss study, some people given the same diet, same exercise, some people lose one pound, somebody might lose nine pounds, same program. So that's, that's the one thing. And again, that's not necessarily a strength or a weakness, um, but it is something I think a lot of people might not value as much as they should. Um, in terms of looking at weaknesses, a good research study will specifically list, these were the limitations of our study. And that's usually towards the end of the study, usually the last paragraph or the second to last paragraph. If you're reading a study and you there's no limitations or no self-identified problems that the researchers identified, that's a problem. Like <laughs> there's always weaknesses. So if you're not seeing that, that's probably a good 
a, a, a good indication that it's not a good study. If the researchers didn't have the uh, professionalism or just the self-awareness to say, hey, we control all these things, but because we control all these things, that leads to some other limitations of what we can say about this. Like one limitation of people living in a facility where you can track every gram that goes into their body. Well, a limitation of that is there's what if they wanted to go, what if a person in the real world drove by Taco Bell at midnight and they would stop at Taco Bell? Well, these subjects didn't even have that option. So that's a limitation. Um, in terms of like, again, researchers typically will also say, hey, the strengths of our study was this. Um, always look for, always, always, always look for the word randomized, where the subjects randomize to their groups. I'm reviewing a study. Is it this month? Man, I cannot keep track of what I'm doing. <laughs> You have a lot going on. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think it's going to come out this month in May. A study wasn't randomized. And I think it's the first time I summarize that I reviewed a study that wasn't randomized. And my argument that is, well, one, I need to make you aware that not every study is good. And just because of this study was very weak in that regard, that doesn't mean it's worthless. There are some other things that we can get value from this study while fully acknowledging this wasn't randomized. Why didn't they? Now, I don't know why they didn't, but I don't think they did. So I hope that answered your question just about things to look for. No, I 100% think that that was super helpful, especially for someone who might be newer to research or even if they have read some research of just being able to read it better. Because I think reading research is a skill. Understanding research is a big time skill. And just the other day, Alex was looking into something for rapid fat loss, actually for a client and seeing what was going to be the best strategy. And he had like five studies pulled up, but one of them was with like Taekwondo and the people were just running. And it's like, well, and it was for like middle-aged men. And this is for like a younger female. And it's like, okay, then that's probably not going to be the best study. So he was, we were on a car ride and he was like, I'm going to throw that one out just because it didn't make sense at not saying that that was a bad study or not saying that the findings were incorrect or anything. It was just application to what I'm looking for and how I'm trying to take this information to apply it to a client. Then that's where really being able to look into the information instead of, I find a lot of people read the title and then read like the average abstract and or conclusion. And then they're like, I have found the conclusion for this study. And it's like, if you dig into the stuff past that, that's where the bulk of the information is that you're able to really tell what are the nuts and bolts of this? And is this applicable to me or to the situation I'm looking at? Yeah. And there's, there's Alex being a, a very educated consumer professional. Is, is his client a Taekwondo athlete? Probably a male <laughs> Taekwondo. <laughs> no. Exactly what you said. And the other thing too, with those, um, often those those combat sports, they're often very water weight focused mm -hmm. to get weight off quickly, which again, doesn't have um, a lot of relevance to, to humans that want to lose fat. Mm -hmm. um, on that note, the other study that we're about to start is we're doing a rapid fat loss in females that are a little older. Um and it's we're, we're very closely mimicking another study that was done in males with obesity. Um, so let's check this out. This study, it's extreme. <laughs> it's very extreme. We're having females. It's only a four-day intervention. Mm -hmm. But during those four days, these we're asking these females to walk six hours per day. And it doesn't have to be cumulative. Just at the end of the day, they have to have walked six hours. And they're, they can only eat around approximately 300 calories. So 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight with as minimal additional fats and carbs. So the perfect diet will be all protein at 1.6 grams per kg or about 0.75 grams per pound. And this is for four straight days that we're having them do this. Yes. Um, <laughs> and this study is kind of, it's dipping my toe into the water of perimenopause. So this sub, this study's in older females. Um, it's a case series study. So we're taking eight women total, two pre two that are not in menopause, two that are in perimenopause, and four that are postmenopause, two of which are on hormone replacement therapy, two that are not. 
And essentially, a lot of women at this stage are some, uh, a percentage, but a lot in this percentage of, of all women do experience weight loss resistance. So I'm just trying to get a sense from a case series study, and this would be a, on the lower quality of research, intervention studies with you know large study sizes. This is not that. I'm just just starting to learn about weight loss resistance in these mid middle aged females. Yeah, I was going to ask if it was perimenopause because that is something that um, one of our coaches just was going through a certification to learn more about perimenopause, just because there are so many variables and life changes a lot. And I'm sure that you relate to this. Of basically any coach that I've talked to has said, like having men lose fat is easy. But when it comes to women, it's like a whole nother beast just because of everything when it comes to their hormones. And then when it comes to postmenopausal, at least the women that I've talked to have felt like they've basically been cast aside of you just can't lose weight. And so I'm glad that there is more research digging into it. I know there is some still out there, but just being able to dig into it instead of kind of just putting the label on it of like, you're perimenopausal, you can no longer lose weight. Um, Because I think that that is a little bit of a cop out uh, and just not true. And so I'm glad that that's getting some more attention and more light in the in the realm. And did you say one of your coaches is taking this certification? Mm -hmm. Do you know what... um you know what certification are taking? You're, yeah, you don't know it's from it's head. from Girls Gone Strong. So they yeah, do. I've heard um, of that. Yeah, they. We have a few coaches who have done the um, perinatal certification through them and had really good experience. And so they were coming out with the perimenopausal one. And so we we're like, let's go ahead and dive into that. Let's see what it's about um, and be able to see if we can see some results with it. Yeah, and, and let me brag on you for a moment. The fact that you have your coaches that you invest in their continuing education, especially this area, I love. It's because that's an investment. Mm -hmm. That is time away from working with clients. And um, I'm I'm very appreciative that that you and Alex support that and not just support it, you embrace it um, because not everybody does. Yeah, it's something we are very passionate about. We've just been able to benefit so much um, from whether it's a certification or we we help within their certifications or just what it looks like for what they're trying to learn. But then we also try to have a monthly or bi-monthly education call where we kind of pull them based on what they're struggling with within their clients of like if a client's not seeing results or if they're kind of stumped on them, we try to see what's going to help the most. And then we try to find an expert. Sometimes it is Alex or I, but we try to find an expert in the field of being able to have them in and talk about it to be able to go over it and problem solve because it's just so much within coaching is being able to continue to learn. And I've seen that firsthand of if you stop learning, especially within coaching, like you're not going to be able to continue to help people and or you're just going to be able to help a very small percentage of people at the very beginning of their journey. Um, and so it's been really powerful to be able to see the coaches continue to evolve and just be able to see their skill set because some of them have skills that I personally don't have or even have to their caliber just because like it might not be my forte or or like my job going in a different direction. Um, so it's really cool to be able to be like, oh, I'm going to talk to one of the coaches about that and be able to pick their brain and it to be able to go both ways. So definitely something we're very, very passionate about. Yes. Well, again, you're making the fitness space a better place by, by doing that. And on the note of the, I'm just going to call it midlife female, it does seem that the fitness industry kind of does cast them as cast that population aside. I don't know why that's the case. It's harder is why like it's very yes. hard to navigate. People want to be able to show fast or crazy results for people. And when it goes into people that have hormonal issues and or going into like perimenopausal, it becomes a lot harder for them. Like that's not even saying like, oh, it's just, it's easier for X, Y, and Z. It like literally and physically is harder for them to lose weight. And so it's something where you have to have more knowledge and you have to be able to have more focus on that and just more skill set to be able to handle it. And I think that it's just easier to not do it than to dive into it. Yeah. <laughs> I think you, you're so articulate. Um, being an e scientist automatically puts me in the evidence based category. What about the they're just the 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 um, the answer or the the statement. 
well, you're not in a, you're just not eating in a caloric deficit. Like you're just, you're not dieting. And I think where I'm at with this, because I'm, I'm a king of SECO. Like if you are in a caloric deficit, you will lose body fat barring a metabolic disease. But here's where my, I guess the caveat comes in. There is a certain percentage of females in perimenopause that Yes, if they're in a caloric deficit, they they will lose weight, lose body fat, but you have to keep lowering and lowering and lowering the calories to the point where it's all it's not sustainable and it's at a level that nobody isn't you know, like it's just miserable. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm obsessed literally obsessed. Like this is where I'm, this is where my brain is going next. This is where a lot of my reading for the summer is laid out. Uh, what is it about? Is it, is it all hormonal? And it, the answer may be yes. Um, does HRT help with that? I think possibly in some situation. Now, the other part of this, here's where I'm going to put on the traditional hat. There's also a um, subset of this population that aren't that aren't tracking macro that are saying yeah it's my hormones and not willing to do any of the actual work that would help them mm-hmm. um, and again my opinions to be fair are coming at this point in time are mainly coming from people like you coaches that work with this population so as you can tell my mind is churning mm-hmm. um, but I'm loving the challenge of trying to 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 do research in in that population and hope to better the space. Yeah, I think that it it definitely is compounded if there is a hormonal aspect to it. And then you also have to think of like, what is their dieting history overall, where you look at it and people again, slap the label because you're perimenopausal, this is what's going on. And I think to a certain degree, the same thing happens with people who are largely overweight. And you and I can both agree that basically every disease has a diet or fitness related aspect and losing weight if you are overweight can help that. But I think a lot of doctors do take the easy way out. If someone's struggling with something, oh, it's just because you're overweight. They kind of just use that just like within perimenopause. It's like, it's just because you're in perimenopause, you can't lose weight. But I think that being able to look at the fact that regardless of if they're in their 50s or if they're in their 30s, they could still have the same aspect of, and especially if they're in their 50s, that they have been dieting and yo-yo dieting for the past 30 years. And so then when they get to perimenopause, then they are in an even worse position. And so you're kind of having to take it all the way back to, okay, what have you been doing? How can we quote unquote, correct this or be able to write this way. And then you're also thinking of how do I get this person to change how they think? Because if they have thought this way for 30 years, or if they've never tracked food, trying to teach someone a brand new way of something when they are, not to say that like 50 is old, I think it's just something of when somebody is older, when they're set in their ways, it can be more difficult, because you're also having to unlearn and relearn all these different things that you've thought or known, quote, to be true about food. And so you're combating their their dieting history, their like food and food history and food knowledge. And then you're also possibly battling things when it comes to um, like how able their body is, because if they haven't trained throughout their life, then they're coming into this age where they're starting to, especially due to the hormones and many other things, they're starting to lose muscle mass. And now it's the hardest to add muscle mass on. And so you're fighting all of these biological factors as well as their whole life that you're having to take into consideration. And so I think that there are so many things that play into it um, that you're trying to go through. Because I think about a client that was dealing with stuff we had kind of worked through and got her in a place where she had a lot better habits, she had a lot better knowledge, and she did see a change in her body. But she also had years of, again, yo-yo dieting, also in the past of being given creams and different hormones without much guidance whatsoever. And so just this variance of, okay, I was told to use this progesterone cream, then I was told to use this TRT, then I was told to use this. And so she has like this 
like mixture of everything going on. And then you add on top of, I not only have to write all of this, but then I have to fight against physiology to a certain degree to be able to get where you want to go. So it is just harder to navigate. And there are so many variables you have to take into consideration. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and I'm just just hearing you go through this and all of the different rabbit trails that you have, it, it is it just goes back to it's harder. That population is harder. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll say this just in case there, there are likely some younger listeners. Uh, my wife and I have her permission to share this story was fit her whole life, lifted weights, um, pretty lean. Um, and when she needed to lose fat, she could when she hit her mid forties. She hit a brick wall. Her energy was non-existent. So even though she knew what to do, um, the just, if you don't have energy Mm -hmm. to get to the gym, um, and that starts a cascade of events that, that wasn't good. Now she's in a much, much better place now, but I just want to say, don't, if you're younger, check, just don't be arrogant because you Mm -hmm. don't know what's in your future. Now, some women just cruise through menopause and they don't have issues. Some, like my wife, they'll hit a wall and and then there's, yeah, everything in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's a lot of variables. So I think it's always being thankful for your health and recognizing that health is wealth (laughs) along the way Um, and being able to keep pouring into that health cup where you can, even if, again, vanity is involved. Because I was talking to someone the other day and they were um, talking about how my skin was soft and they're like, oh, I do such a bad job of moisturizing. Like, how'd you get yourself to like be better at using moisturizer? Because I used to suck at it. I would never put lotion on. And I was like, it uh, really only started because I wanted to self-tan slash spray tan, and then it didn't sit well if my skin wasn't moisturized. So it wasn't this aspect of like, oh, I want to <laughs> make sure my skin is nice and all this. It was like, I want to look tanner, and so I need to be moisturized to look more tan. And now it has turned into a habit that is for my health and that I enjoy doing. Now there's still the aspect of making sure my spray tan looks good, but it is something that I was able to start due to vanity, but then be able to continue due to my health. And I think any way that you can kind of sneak health in the back door and be able to do these different things, even if it starts with something of, I just want to look better, or I just want my spray tans to look better, that you're able to look at it that way. And instead of like, I used to um, kind of maybe shame isn't the best word, but like shame myself to a certain degree of not being super health focused for certain things. But I now I kind of like whatever gets me to the end destination, then that's really what matters. It's not that I need to tell people of I do such a good job with my moisturizer because I care about my skin and you should care about your skin too. It's like I literally just wanted my spray tans to look better. But now I understand how it helps my skin and how I feel as a person because of that. Um, So I think that it's completely fine to have vanity in that aspect, especially when it then sneaks in that health in that back door. Yes. Yep. And yeah, you just you just said it. It it starts as one thing and then the 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 action main the action is maintained, but the motivations can change. A hundred percent. And let me just ask this. um, I'm thinking, thinking of my wife. And I just told my, literally just told my wife this today. Like my wife looks young and she doesn't get any treatments or anything, but she is always put lotion on, um, moisturizer. Mm -hmm. Is, is that really that effect? Like, does that keep you like your skin soft or something? More than moisturizer. Moisturizer helps a ton, but more than moisturizer SPF, like Number one anti-aging secret that I've heard from so many people time and time again, and I even see it in myself, is SPF. And like if you consistently, not just like, oh, when I'm out at the beach for a long day, I spray some SPF on, like I put SPF on every single day, rain or shine on like, especially my face. Like I'm not going to lie and say that I always put it on my body every single day, especially when I'm in the Midwest and we don't see the sun for a couple of months, but on my face and like my neck, no matter what, I'm like SPF because any way that I can anti-age, then I will go ahead and do that. Um, So that's something else where it's like, I've been told for years that SPF is good for me, But that never was enough of a motivator to be like, okay, I'm going to use it. It was then when someone was like, it's anti-aging. I was like, give me the bottles of SPF. (laughs) I will take it all. 
<laughs> they, need, they needed to put that on the bottle. I know. <laughs> just anti-aging across it and all the girls will buy it. <laughs> Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s, able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. Um, I did want to ask within Body by Science of what was the reason that you started it? Because you just started it semi-recently. July of 2022 was the first issue. So were you wanting or waiting to do this for a while or how did it come about? Yeah, I have wanted to do it for many, many years, um, 10 years, 12 years. So um, I, the reason I didn't do it earlier was my, the way my career works I had, I kept getting, there's two levels of promotion. So I made to the final end. I'm, I'm what you call a full professor. So that was, I didn't have the time or I didn't, I had the time. I didn't want to invest the time into something like this. Um, so that was the timing aspect. The, the motivation was, um, now at the time I thought of this, there was one other research review out there, um, Alan Aragon, I don't know mm -hmm. if you're familiar with his. So his was out there and his was the only one. Um, and I've never read his, but I, I, I imagine it's very good. Like, so he was the pioneer in, in this space. Um, and I'm just thinking, I, I think this is the, the, if, if I, if I want to make an impact on the profession, I can do that through research, but there's a lot of researchers and my research has always been directed at the practitioner. And if I'm going to be honest, my research exists to serve physique coaches, weight loss coaches, not all competitive, you know, not, they don't all have to be bodybuilding coaches, but people who, fitness professionals who help people with weight loss. That's who my research serves. And then I realized, well, not everybody's going to read my research articles. In fact, I may be the only one that reads my research <laughs> articles. Um, so, I, I think I, I have the, a gift of communicating the the science, the research to a general audience. So I kind of just leaned into that. And that's, I think that's why it's like, I think I can make a better impact if this is what I do. Um, and thank you. So uh, for those that don't know, I bring in experts on every issue or I review the research and then I ask experts like coaches, physicians, dietitians, hey, how would you apply this research to your clients? Because I'm not a coach. Um, and you have done that, I think, twice now. Yeah. Funny enough, it was actually the March episode or March episode, the March issue, both <laughs> times. Um, I was looking back because I was getting it ready to send to our email list and everything um, to be able to have that. And it was like March 2023 and then March 2024. Well, yeah, and that, that might be on purpose. I don't like to ask you more than like if I <laughs> yeah, can I ask you every makes year. Sense. <laughs> <laughs> Which it did end up connecting Philip and I, and he was actually just on yes. the podcast a few weeks ago. And then my episode with him, I think released in a little bit and within a few days or a week. Um, so it was great to connect with him and we had a really great conversation. Uh, so very thankful for that aspect and um, just thankful for it as a whole because I think it's so great to be able to be able to see what research is out there because just honestly, I'm not sitting there scrolling through what's every single research article that's come out within fitness. Like I might be looking for something specific for a client, but it was really eye-opening to be able to see, okay, these are the things that are coming out. These are things, these are ways that I can apply it. Um, and just being able to, again, understand 
how the research is done, because I think that's the biggest gap. And what you saw, the biggest gap within the general population is not being able to either have access to the study or being able to thoroughly read and understand that study. So I feel like you very much so bridge that gap um, and are able to give just such an incredible resource to so many people. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for for sharing your expertise. (laughs) I am very happy to um, and happy to do it as many times as you would like me to. Um, I did want to ask you of how you balance improving your health while speaking to the desire to just look better. Um, All right. So that's a little touchy because I've I've not been – I've not been – the um the most i don't want to say sincere cuz i think i'm sincere i'll just say this i i got diagnosed with a shoulder condition that funny enough it's menopausal women who get the um, frozen shoulder most often so i have frozen shoulder which is a freaking pain um and it basically means i have limited mobility and 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 pretty sharp pain and i couldn't squat i could not get my arm in the position of being able to do a squat so most people most um, diligent, <laughs> health-minded fitness professionals would say, okay, I'll do something else. But no, I got in my head and became a big baby. And I said, well, if I can't squat, I'm not doing nothing. Now, I didn't set out to say that, but that's what it turned into. So I was in a bad space, um, not not like a mental, like depressed, but I'm just like, just not even working out with weights. Um, very consistently at all for the last few months. Um, and then recently said, or, or my wife said, get over it. Can you leg press? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> can, can you, can, and I, I mean, I actually got my shoulder to an hour I, right, right before we got on. I, I was actually bench pressing. So again, um, I don't want to sit here and say, oh, I do all this for my health. And I I, I was as big a baby as anybody. <laughs> now I'm an all or nothing type of person, but I worked through it, um, wrote out, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go now, I think. Um, but generally, uh, I think the one thing is age as I've gotten older. And like you said earlier, I don't know how you said it, but health is wealth or just being appreciative of being able to do things. I never thought twice about being able to do a squat. Now, may, I've had back pain throughout my life, but not being able to put my arm be, behind me to grip the bar, I, that never thought never crossed my mind. So I still can't squat. Um, so I'm really looking forward to when I can start squatting again as soon as this heals. Um, but I, you know, I, I just did a belt squat. Um, but I, I would say in general, Um, a difference in myself, very solely physique minded for many years. As I get older, I'm like, maybe I should get more fiber. Um, I want to start doing more mobility things. And I, I, in myself, I think it's just age. Um, if nothing else, it's things like, Hey, um, I need to probably do more plyometrics. Um, as I'm older, I'm losing type two muscle fiber. So I need to do the things like explosive, powerful movements that will stimulate those muscle fibers so that I won't lose them. So that's not the best answer. And I'm as- No, I think it's a very candid answer of, I think oftentimes people take either researchers or fitness professionals and they put them on this pedestal of you always do everything perfect and everything is whether it's easy for you or whatever it may be of you have it all figured out and it's like at the end of the day we're still human too and there are things that we might know the answer for and we still don't always do it or there might be things where we understand the greater aspect of it and we still might not always do it and I think that's something very interesting just within human behavior of and this kind of relates to what we've just been talking about in general of the aspect of it making you feel better isn't enough motivation for someone to do it. And like same for myself of like, let's say I go for a walk. I'm like, oh, that made me feel good. That's not enough for me to continue to go on walks for the the benefit of it making me feel good. There has to be something else attached to it for human beings to continue doing it. Otherwise, we would all just always do the right thing. We'd all be super duper fit and have everything figured out. But we're human and sometimes we, you know, 
just fall fall victim to being human beings. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But I did want to ask you just because you had it at the end of that blurb in regards to fitness lifestyle being enjoyable, where you said you embrace uh, simplicity without compromising on what works. So what's an example of how you embrace simplicity without compromising on what works in your real life? Um, an example would be like simplicity. I, I like I like for people to, for myself or for anybody else, track as few things as possible for your metrics. Um, some people want to track ev everything. Um, so if I take this minimalist, this simple approach, track your calories, track your protein. I'm at the point where I don't care how many f grams of carbs and fat I eat. That's that's my, like, I don't, it doesn't matter. Those are not needle movers. Um, the research that I rely on, um, in my own lab as well. Um, if you track protein and you track calories, track your working sets um, for your resistance training program. How many sets are you doing from a physique mindset here? How many working sets are you doing per body part per week? Protein and calories, that's that's the minimalist approach. I think those um, those are the basics. So that that is what that is the answer to your question in the the minimalist, simplest ap approach or or um, perspective that I could give. Mm -hmm. I think that it's something where when um, I used to like look at a lot of fitness advice before I'm where I am now, and it was always very simple things of move your body, drink water, sleep. And I was like, there has to be more to it. And now that I've kind of come full circle, I am now like almost a decade into it. And I find myself telling people of like, because they're like, oh, do I need to do this? Do I need to do this? I probably shouldn't eat this and I have to do this special thing. And I'm like, hey, if you just, you know, sleep, drink water and move your body, you're all good. And I kind of find myself kicking myself of like, hey, that didn't work for you years ago when you heard other people say it. But <laughs> I find that sometimes the most advanced thing that you can do is the basics consistently. And that consistently is a big asterisk there, a big underline there of the basics are basic, but if you can consistently do them, that is one of the most advanced things that you can do for your health and for your wellness for it to compound over time is just doing those basics consistently. And people want to get so fancy with it, whether it's to name something different so that they catch someone in with their marketing or to say that they've got this new strategy or this magic pill for you. And it's like, just do the basics consistently and you will see results at the end of the day. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned sleep. Um, I'm, I've always said, Hey, your nutrition, your exercise. And and now man, I'm, I have to remember sleep. Um, I don't <laughs> think it was your issue. I think it's the issue coming out next. Um, sl sleep. If you're trying to optimize your body composition, um, if a, let me just say sleep insufficiency, not getting enough sleep works against your, your efforts to build muscle. And it actually causes you to gain fat. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's everything opposite of what you want to optimize your physique. If you're not getting sufficient sleep. Yeah. Sleep is the greatest performance enhancing drug that most people are not utilizing. And it's something yeah. that I outline, let's say a client is in a place and they're like, I'm not gaining muscle, losing fat how I want to. And I'm like, hey, we're doing everything that we can, but the big variable here that's off is sleep. And it's like, well, how big of a deal is that? And I'm like, that is the number one sleep affects almost every single process in our body. It, is, it affects our ability to focus, our ability to balance, to have creativity. It affects our ability to gain muscle, to lose fat, our digestion, our blood sugar. It affects absolutely everything in our body. It's at the core of it. And it kills me that people are like, well, I'm tracking my macros and I'm hitting my training sessions. Why am I not seeing progress? And I'm like, well, your sleep is a shit show over here. So we should <laughs> probably look at the sleep first and be able to get that rocking and rolling. And I think it's so underestimated. And it's kind of like that saying of like, sleep is for the weak. And so I've rebranded it and said, sleep is for the elite. Because if you are going to be elite in anything that you do, Ooh. you need to have sleep. And that is at like the core of it all is being able to sleep. <laughs> I like that. I, I I like that. And I'm going to just add, this month's issue, you'll be able to hand them. Here's a study. If you doubt me, 
do you believe this research study? Well, I'll be excited to go ahead and serve it up to some people <laughs> in the nice way possible, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, perfect. I enjoyed our talk so much. It was great to be able to learn a little bit more about you personally, as well as being able to talk about some different things professionally. One question I actually got from Philip that I've been asking recently is, what is one question that you wished I asked that I didn't ask? You asked me about buffalo wings. You asked what my research is. Oh, um, you could have asked, um, how do how does my lab, how has it had the success that it's had? for 10 years doing what we do. And, and I'll answer that. I get incredible, talented students. Um, my, I do not, I don't have a large budget. So my, my lab is a student centered volunteer lab. So master students, undergraduate students. Um, I'm, I'm very blessed that students want to come study with me. And they designed, when I talked to you about that reverse diet study, my, my team designed the whole thing very first day to getting ready to launch um, later this week. So Yeah, we just actually had Chris Bearcat on recently as well. Um, we, yes. are, we have a series coming out. It'll be coming out closer to the summer months, but Chris was a part of that series. Um, and he talked a little bit about the work that you guys are doing. Um, so it's just very cool and it is very successful. So anyone listening, I will make sure I have Bill's um, Instagram down below, which he does post some excerpts from Body by Science and some great information on there. I will also have a link so anyone can go and purchase the Body by Science themselves. It's like, what is it, $7 a month? It's a steal. $7.99, yes. $7.99 a month, or you can buy it for the year and get a discount on that. So I will have those links down below so you can grab it, as well as any other other ways that you will need to be able to reach Bill um, or anything like that? Is there anywhere else people can find you or anywhere else you want to direct people towards? I don't think so. So BillCampbellPhD.com and then Instagram is BillCampbellPhD. So that, that's, <laughs> that's that's everywhere where I'm at, my website and Instagram. Makes it easy, which I will just say a really funny story before we get off. So when I first met Alex, I actually met him through mutual friends at the Arnold, very fitness of us to meet at the Arnold. Uh, <laughs> but I didn't know him like beforehand. I just knew I'd seen him on Instagram and his uh, handle was Alex Bush PD for physique development, yeah. obviously. But I always thought he was much older than me. It was probably like the beard and everything that just made me think that he was older than me. And I guess I just misread it for however long I saw it on Instagram that I thought it said Alex Bush PhD. And so we went out to a bar, which is also really funny because like we don't regularly drink and we like met at a bar. Um, so it was by chance as a whole, but he was saying something and I was like, you just think you're so smart, Alex Bush PhD. And he was like, what are you talking about? And I, the whole time I just thought it was Alex Bush PhD. So I always get a good <laughs> laugh out of that. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, but it does. Hey, it could have been ED. Yeah. You didn't you didn't misread it for that. Yeah, so. that's true. That's true. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your time and for this episode. And I'll talk to you later. Yes, thank you.